Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan, and welcome to a very spooky episode of the show. It's it's that time of year, and uh, Alex decided that he would start his spooky adventure early by coming down with a curse, and it has given him some sort of a, a virus or bacterial infection that he cannot get rid of yet. The, the spookiest thing are microbes. We are very lucky that, that I am not alone today. Uh, I am joined uh, by the one and only Stephen Dewey returning to the show. Stephen, thank you for coming back on. Hello. Thank you for having me. Oh, yes, absolutely. And uh, I, I have to say it's been a little while since you've been on the show. A couple it of years. It has ago. been. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. When we, you originally came on, uh, we had just met you at B-Fig, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Alex had uh, picked up a copy of Ten Candles. Yes. And uh, he uh, was uh, very interested in it, and he was like, oh, this is such an interesting concept, and I still didn't understand what was going on, but I, w but I encouraged him. <laughs> During that time, it was like the first time we had ever heard of this this brand new thing called Ten Candles. Yes. But if it felt like after like the, in the next year or so, everyone was talking about Ten Candles. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, I was like, yeah. "Oh, I know that game." <laughs> yeah, Pe people have picked it up, run with it, talked about it. The sort of reception that it has received is mind-blowing to me and what's what's bewildering is that it is my first real solitary game project that i've published so i didn't sure. I, I have no concept of sort of what is good and what is bad and uh, <laughs> over the past several years slowly it's been dawning on me that like hey i think this game's uh done done pretty well like i had no yeah. idea it's yeah. so hard for me to have any basis for a comparison, but right. it's, it's gotten around. It's been featured on a whole bunch of review sites, Twitch streams, things like that. It's it's monumental, the amount of support that folks are showing for the game. It's, it's really mind-blowing. You know that it's a, a big deal because I had seen it on things that were completely uh, separate from anything Ten Candles related that, that you would have been put Like, all of a sudden, just, I think I saw, like, Hyper RPG, which I follow, because I know some people over there, and they were like, yeah, we're playing Ten Candles, and I'm like, I know that game. Yeah, uh, Hyper, Hyper RPG picked it up, and then, uh, not immediately afterwards, but a little bit afterwards, Geek and Sundry picked it up, and they both ran these ten-episode just monstrosities of amazingness and it's <laughs> been it, it was very exciting to watch uh the sort of respective fan bases flock to the game and support it it's it's been bewildering but a lot of fun congratulations on all that success i am really glad you. that you had such a monumental hit but uh, you know now because 10 candles is a very good game to be playing this time of year uh, yeah. I was uh, I was hoping that you might be able to tell me a little bit about some of the scenarios, some of your favorite kinds of settings to play a game like Ten Candles in. Like like where where do you want to go in order to get this kind of great horror and tension going on in your game? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've run oh boy, just a lot of games of Ten Candles, as you might imagine. Uh, and really, they have spanned the gamut of scenarios and modules to a pretty extreme degree. Uh, because I've run all the modules really in the book at this point, probably two to three times over, and. I obviously want the game to stay fun for me, so I've also kind of gone off script. I've made a lot of one-shot modules. I've pulled inspiration for ideas from 
short films, from video games, from various, you know, YouTube videos that I've seen, anywhere I could sort of harvest an idea for a game. Mm. Um, and there's just what continues to surprise me, and, you know, maybe it shouldn't because I wrote the darn thing, is that <laughs> there, there are, there's just so many ways you can play that game it fits it's more increasingly i see it more as a toolbox for a very specific type of storytelling than i see it as uh, a, a very one-dimensional specific kind of horror game there's a lot you can mm. do with it i mean just to name a few kind of offhandedly i can get into sort of a, a longer description of some of these sessions but to name a few offhandedly, you know, mm -hmm. one of my favorites that I also always tell people about is I had a session where the players were, I guess the more appropriate facsimile nowadays would be they were basically playing the Avengers. At the time, it was a little bit more in line with playing Power Ranger adjacent mech pilots that were <laughs> all in their respective animal themed robots uh going right. off to have all the robots join together and fight some massive threat that was endangering the world but this idea of kind of playing 10 candles as a, what is effectively a superhero game you, the, you sort of have the end of the game baked in where what you're trying to do is save the world sure. but you, you know you're going to die at the end but maybe you save the world first Right. So oh, okay. then that it introduces sort of another end game condition where we're not just playing to see how we die. We're also sort of curious as to whether or not these heroes will save the world before they do so, whether their final act will be heroic or horrible, you know, and it shapes mm -hmm. the game in a certain different kind of way, which is really exciting. It's end game. Basically, you made a right. game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay. You know, so it can it can either end like Infinity War ended, or it can end right. like Endgame ended, right? Depending on how sure. things go. Sure. Um, another uh, module that I ran was a uh, for a group that wanted um, a lighter experience. Uh, I ran a group through a module where essentially all of the characters were members of this modern day cult this you know cthulhu-esque praising the coming apocalypse style sort of bizarro weird cult and it, it's the sort of cult that has membership dues and matching sort of <laughs> robes that you can order from their online store and no one Perfect. really takes anything seriously about it mm -hmm. um you know all of this is it's sort of an, they sort of all got into it because they were old college friends. They wanted an excuse to kind of spend time together and they go. The cult goes on, you know, pretty cool camping trips every so often. And you got to sit through kind of the, you know, the weird culty stuff for like a few hours every night. But then the rest of the time you can just go canoeing and you know, right. <laughs> all it's, sorts of things. It's, it's cult scouts. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an activity that they're all yeah. sort of enjoying together. Sure. Um, and the the session began with. Uh, the group of them performing one of these, you know, multitude of lame, weird sort of rituals to bring about the end times. And as soon as they finish it, the sky goes black. Oh, and they have to these uh -huh. sort of fair weather cultists who did not mean to bring about the end of the world have to try and who are exp sort of being seen as the bringers of this darkness and being raised up to meet with these horrible things and horrible creatures that they've summoned want nothing more than to reverse everything. Oh God, we didn't mean to do this. And <laughs> hilarity ensued until right. they all got horribly, horribly consumed. Perfect. Uh, and it was great. It was a lighter sort of version of the game. People were able to engage with sort of the darker themes of 10 candles while still keeping it light, keeping it easy breezy sure. um, and having fun with it. Yeah, yeah, you know, that does seem to be a, a running theme in any kind of like Lovecraftian horror is that it, you, you don't you don't test the waters. You pretty much have to just yeah, you assume the worst because it's coming. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. And then a, a third one I can sort of uh, toss out there as well had to do with the players that I was running it for all happened to be veteran like Dungeons and Dragons players like OSR. They really hadn't 
cracked into story games before mm -hmm. in a big way. And I ran a module for them where they were all members of an adventuring party. And they Ooh. were on their way to kill a dragon that had been uh, terrorizing the countryside. They were heroes. They were you know, powerful fantasy characters. And we all knew how that confrontation would inevitably end. Uh, but they're going off to do their best. And even in that uh, bizarre mashup of genres, it worked really well. You know, I, the player who's playing a wizard uh, wanted to cast some spells, and we just rolled for that like we would roll for any sort of conflict. And oh, hey, okay. if, if you succeed, yeah, you do it, and you got more sixes than me, so what does that spell look like? What does it do? And it, it worked just as well, you know, as you would hope to do it through any system. Yeah. Uh, and it was remarkably effective and <laughs> engaging. And we got to see these heroes rise up and inevitably fall. And it was a tragic but really great fantasy story, bizarrely. That was a lot of fun. I kind of like Baby's first occult setting. You know, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's uh, when, when you were talking about it, uh, I started to think, you remember that scene in uh, Adam's Family Values where uh, Wednesday Adams ends up going to the summer camp and then everything is on fire, basically? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's kind of what I imagine happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's pretty, pretty on par. Yep. <laughs> great great uh and and so okay and, and so you can do superheroes you can do anything like that if i wanted to uh however have like a setting where i was really i was just going full in i'm i'm gonna be terrified mm -hmm. i want to be i want to be scared i want the ch -ch 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 kind of yeah. the experience <laughs> right yeah what do you think is a really good setting for that well, uh, that can really depend on the group and the GM. Um, I always say trust your GM because they're going to pick a module that they can really get some fear behind. I usually like for those settings to pick a module that is outside of the comfort zone of a lot of the players. So as opposed to, you know, uh, you being a local in Massachusetts and you're in Boston and you know, because I'm very familiar with that setting and I, many of the people I play with would be comfortable in that setting. Sure. Rather than that, I want to put players somewhere where they're not really comfortable, where they're not super familiar with what the place looks like and how you're supposed to act or, or how you would engage with it. One of the ones that I often use for new players um, is actually one that's in the book, which is the uh, module that's played on the moon. And it's played on sort mm. of a international space station moon base on the moon. You already have a bunch of things built in. It could be aliens. It could be infections. It could be you know, your fellow crew members that have gone nuts. But you, have right. this, you have this massive, sprawling uh, moon base with parts of it that are broken down, parts of it where you're going to have to go out onto the moon's surface to get to mm. another area. You've got limited oxygen. You've got a lot of things built in already that are people don't really, you know, I, I'm not playing that with any folks who know a lot about how spacesuits work. So <laughs> I can I can kind of get away with a lot. We don't have to focus as much on the specifics and we can sort of just go with the flow, which allows people to worry more about the dangers and the fear and the horrible things that are happening around them. Right. Uh, so some, something like that, uh, especially if it's something that the DM is comfortable sort of uh, improvising with, um, if they have a specific genre that they really enjoy. But what I, what I tend to find is that for the really scary sessions, unless you have um, an idea already about what you want to do with the scary uh, or or you have a terrifying idea that you want to see play out um, mm. sticking with the with the default idea of that the world is dark and there's monsters in the darkness tends to work really well for any session that's right. sort of what we present as the default and that idea of needing to find lights and staying in the lights and monsters being just outside in the darkness that reflects in the actual production of the game you're sitting around candles and if you can make the characters scared of the darkness while the players are in the darkness mm -hmm. that 
sort of parallel in presentation is also really helpful for getting people a little bit spooked, a little bit nervous. If you need to uh, take a break to go to the bathroom at the end of the long, dark hall and your players are in a dark building where there are monsters, it, it helps <laughs> It helps to add to that. Yes, I can imagine it certainly does, uh, especially considering that, uh, yeah, you do have this added benefit, especially with Ten Candles, where the light itself is like a character. Right. And so by allowing that, uh, it, it does give you a more tactile sensation than if I that somebody's just saying, well, it's getting very dark. Well, now I know it's actually, I, I, you know, actually experiencing the darkness definitely gives me something more to to work off of. It, so I like the idea of being on the moon or some kind of a foreign setting in general, just because there's so much more to think about. If I'm not very good at understanding how the moon works, though. If I was thinking about, like, maybe something I know about, but maybe my players don't know about, that would probably be a good starting point, maybe? Like, I think um, so, definitely. Like, like how you order trucks. That would be, like, I could, I could explain that to them, but they'd, they'd feel very lost. That might be a hard sell. Uh, but, um, well, okay, kind of adjacent to that, though, I have had someone, I, I've heard of folks who were really familiar with boats that ran that have yes. run the uh there's a module in the back of the book where you're on sort of a cruise ship that's broken down in the middle of the ocean while the world's gone dark and oh, they yeah. were able to kind of take that and run with it because they knew a lot more about as the as sort of the gm they knew a lot about boats so they could they didn't have to kind of stretch as much for improvisation material um, mm. as opposed to like me i tried to run that once for a group in which someone did know a lot about boats and we it was very difficult to set the scene i didn't have a lot of knowledge to pull from and sure. whenever i said something that was wrong they pointed it out and corrected me and it, you know that's always a little tricky <laughs> so it's good as the gm to play in a in an environment that you mm. know at least a little about or feel really comfortable uh improving about uh and if it's something sure. that you know about more than your players do that's totally fine it, it will just give you more material to play with i mean i know uh, a considerable amount about sharks only because i'm terrified of sharks uh but then again i think everybody kind of knows about sharks so i don't <laughs> i i know that that's going to be like because uh, the collective fear <laughs> seems, right. to, seems to permeate no a more traditional setting Sure. A more traditional setting. Like, I would normally think, if you were going back to, like, the Friday the 13th thing, okay, there's probably a camp. Absolutely. And it's probably next to a lake. But if you were looking at, like, a traditional horror setting like that, what what are some of your favorites? One of the modules I wrote in the back of the book is basically there's a cabin in the woods, and you're all Perfect. on spring break, and you're going there to party hard, and see what happens um that's sort of a classic setting that's already in the book um you can have i i always like my horror to be a little weird i i don't i don't wa personally watch a lot of horror in sort of just like suburban america where someone's out to get you i'll right. watch like um so one of the sessions i ran had to do with a um deep sea mining expedition uh oh. so the players were sort of on this oil platform in the middle of the ocean and they were taking this little submarine down uh to do some like emergency mining uh, about this strange thing that they found beneath the water mm. um and that you know that was great because it put them in a very small sort of container in a dangerous sort of abandoned environment bodies of water seem to be a common theme with horror items. oh yeah yeah the depths the because depths because there's it, there's so much that's unknown about it there is there yeah. is and it's it's one of those things that's sort of entertaining about 10 candles is that you don't really i mean if you're playing by sort of the default rules you as the gm don't really know what the monster is going to be it's really one of your players that makes that decision while you are creating characters Mm -hmm. So even though you can sort of choose a module or a setting that kind of is exciting to you, you might choose a, a camp, like a summer camp by a lake, uh, expecting to get a certain type of game. And then your player writes down, uh, I've seen them and they are alien invaders, right? Sure. And suddenly it's a 
it's a very different it's sort of a mashup of two different sorts of horror stories um and you need to kind of be able to run with that but uh so it it can take some classic horror tropes and settings and kind of turn them on their head in an interesting way and and on the flip side of it i'm trying to think of what would be because i like making things harder on myself sure. i start <laughs> thinking i start thinking what is the hardest kind of setting i could use to create any kind of tension or fear and so my mind like goes to something like bouncy castle like yeah you know but then again carnivals kind of scary carnivals especially are kind of scary yeah yeah i've yeah. had more more than a few games wind up at no fault of my own it wasn't even necessarily part of the original pitch for the setting but i had more than a few wind up at a circus for one reason or another <laughs> yeah just, yeah that just happens <laughs> and it, it's really funny too because the more i think about it some of the things that i would think are the most innocuous of settings are actually horrifying because i started to think oh maybe a toy store oh no no that's not gonna be good <laughs> that's gonna be <laughs> that's gonna be horrifying that's five nights at freddy territory <laughs> like that's, oh definitely no. it's chucky all over the place like that's those toys chucky. are gonna the, yeah. the, the, it's, a, it's a horrible horrible twist on toy story and you're not gonna love it even my poor like department store and stuff like oh the, the lights go out and someone's chasing you and I can't figure out where aisle three is right now. Like all of a sudden, <laughs> like all of a sudden, I can't see the numbers. Damn it. Like all of a sudden, I start to realize, oh yeah, yeah, a lot of my very, you know, happy shiny places really can turn very, very dark very quickly if you try. It doesn't even take much to do. Anyone out there who happens to be listening, if you have a, a setting that you think cannot possibly be scary, challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> find a way what scares you personally oh boy. <laughs> that's a great question i i would i would probably have to say it comes down more to danger or, or dangerous situations for people that i care about that are sort of outside of my control anytime that uh, situations sort of are contained and then spiral out of control and people are in danger. You know, those are, as happens in really any horror movie ever, um, mm -hmm. that, that sort of general idea can really throw you. I tend to find when I am on the receiving end of like a horror game or something like that, um, I am often much more haunted by the content if I see other players around the table who are suffering or, you know, non-player characters that I have some reason to care about who are suffering or in danger or being harmed or being dragged off and kidnapped. And I am in a position where I literally can't do anything about it. And those, right. those sorts of moments of indecision and, and being frozen up and not really knowing what to do do and just sort of having to sit back in the chair and be like, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, what what do we do? Those are the moments that I think it feels real to me in a big way. If you can get those moments around a table, that is what you're going for. I mean, you're look, you're really, and the darkness and the candles and every everything, all of the extraneous sort of components that Ten Candles has. It's all one big funnel towards that moment where you really, for even just a moment, it feels really real. Um, yeah. and, and you feel that that sorrow or that the impact of your decisions or the consequences that you're facing. That's what really brings the game to life. You were talking about like how it's scary when things are outside of your control. And for me, uh, I think I get more terrified that so the tensest moments of my life are where it feels like I do have control and I cannot figure out how to actually do anything about it like what? i have the agency <laughs> yeah but i can't get a hold of how to utilize it correctly <laughs> uh, because because if something's just out of my control i'm just like well nothing i can do <laughs> just throw up your hands just say yeah this is gonna suck but if i actually feel like maybe i could influence the situation at all then it's like oh no now i have to figure out what i'm gonna do I, I always felt like Ten Candles, uh, at least up until the end, 
sort of gives players that feeling like, oh, maybe I can actually do something. It gives you too much control. <laughs> yes, yes. And it slowly takes it away. Takes it away, yeah. And you know, that is actually way more terrifying than if you just took it away from people in the it, beginning. It absolutely does. It, it makes you, it gives you all this power such that you almost take it for granted. Mm-hmm. And as it slowly slips away, it is almost asking you the question, did you make good use of it while you had it? <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. did you, are you proud of the decisions that you made with all that power? Because it's gone now. And, and seeing people's faces sort of fall as their die pool gets smaller and they fail faster, moving the game quicker towards its end, yeah. uh, is, is, you know, I, I, I call it fun and it, it is, it's just a different, a different sort of fun. And I think that, uh, yeah. you know, players feel that too. And it's exciting to watch uh, and, you know, there is a certain amount of enjoyment that you get out of building these characters up and watching them crumble apart. That's right. fascinating and enjoyable and fun and tragic and horrible all at the same time. Right. Yeah. It does feel like there is a bit of a running theme with any kind of like horror game where uh, you start out from a position where you have like confidence, you know who you are, you have some influence or power, and that just keeps going away as you progress. The The last episode we did, we were talking about Call of Cthulhu, mm-hmm. and in that system, it very much does that kind of thing, where your sanity just keeps getting destroyed as you go along. And uh, and so you are almost having a, a, a devolution rather than an evolution uh, of your character. Yeah, and I I, I actually have uh, led a couple panels talking about something adjacent to that, and I think I think it would be good to say like that should be the structure. I think, or that is really a good way to structure your rules and your framework for a horror game because that is. I mean, that's that's horror. That is the quintessential, you know, if you're if you're mapping out the sort of rise and fall of characters in any horror movie at all, that is sort of what you want. They start in a place of safety and it increasingly gets worse and they have moments of hope sprinkled in there and they have moments of terror sprinkled in there. But it always is this sort of decline at decline that may or may not you know, recover at the end, depending on what kind of story it is. Uh, And I think that really one, one of the things I really tried to do with 10 candles is, you know, it can be hard for a GM who's not really good at telling scary stories or may not be a dedicated storyteller to, it may be difficult for them to manufacture that sort of arc, that emotional arc throughout horror role-playing game or any kind of scary game. So what I tried to do with 10 candles and I have seen done in some other uh, tabletop RPGs as well is to very purposefully create rules that force Mm -hmm. that sort of arc over the course of the game. So the game's (sighs) rules, they do all the heavy lifting for you. Even if you're not as experienced, if you're a newer GM or you're just kind of nervous, the game takes a lot of that effort and sort of almost by, well, I mean, by design, it almost forces you to build those sorts of patterns into your game. So you're going to have that arc, which is going to mimic that classic sort of tension rising and falling of uh, your favorite horror stories. So I love seeing that in games. I love seeing very intentional design behind that to create that sort of story because that's what you're really looking at. some of the things that i've found are that uh i get more scared when i didn't think the thing that i was going to be scared by was scary at the beginning mm-hmm. and and then it became scary later actually i've played D 5e basically for the first time ever <laughs> uh this last year well and <laughs> yes, welcome, welcome. And I, I did it, and I was like, you, you do realize that I'm going to be a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, right? And they're like, yep, of course, of course we knew of you were going to do that, Nathan. I'm a big punch turtle, basically, and I'm big and I'm girthy and I'm, I'm really hard to hit. And 
I'm a shadow monk, so I'm you know, warping all over the place and jumping onto the backs of Shadowfell dragons. I'm doing I'm doing all sorts of fun things. Uh, you know, no problem, you know, or, or orcs and all that good stuff. The most terrifying situation I ended up in was when this poor urchin girl was like, my sister's sick, my sister's sick. And I was like, okay, I'll come and help you. And we go down into, like, the basements, and it turns out that, like, all these kids were were actually monsters that were trying to lure me and my, my teammate down <laughs> into the basement. Yeah, that's to, terrifying. Yeah, it's it's terrifying, especially the way it was all set up, where it's like, well, we're, we're going down, and there are rags on the ceiling, and mm. so I'm, so, so I can't light my torch because I'm going to, the whole thing's going to get, get set on fire. And she's trying to lead us through giant, like, iron doors, and I keep going, no, you first, I will follow, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I have to keep rolling for wisdom saves to make sure I actually succeed in that. Oh, man. Yeah, and, and where where we get like a few down, and you can see other kids kind of in the background, and there's no light, and you know I'm I'm big punch turtle, but my my partner who's with me is a, a halfling barbarian, so he's just up for anything basically. <laughs> yeah. and, and there's a point where he's like, uh, "Gee, should we uh, should we stay and fight or go?" And I'm kind of like, "I'm all out of key points." <laughs> I can't, help. <laughs> I can't do anything right now. That was really the scariest thing. You could you could throw giants and dragons and everything else at me, and but for some reason, none of them ever reached the kind of tension or fear that I felt because an urchin girl told me that her sister was sick, and it was past that where I was like, can't trust anything in this game. <laughs> can't yeah, trust and that's anything. so that's one of those uh, great examples of like you know I, I like introducing sort of horror into a large number of game systems whenever I can. I, whenever I'm running a game, you know, I love to bring the spook to it. And, you know, D&D is a great example of like, you can tell any kind of story with that game if you're a good storyteller. And sometimes just the way the session goes, it creates a way better, it's sort of better than the sum of its parts sort of thing. And the way yeah. the dice roll and things like that. But uh, at its core, you really need to be, you need to have a great dungeon master for those sorts of moments who can right. set that up. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I, you know, I love Dungeons and Dragons. I play it all the time, but I also have a veritable archive of indie games on my shelves because when I'm looking for a really sure. specific experience, that uh you know maybe i could maybe i could kind of patch together in sort of an open system like dungeons and dragons i if i have this specific system that supports a certain kind of play um it, it it's just kind of gonna win every time because the rules are there to really guide that specific kind of right. uh, role-playing experience uh, so see. like it, it's always one of those things where like the the exception to every rule is well, if you have an amazing GM or DM, you're golden. You can do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> if you want like a helping hand, that's where a lot, you know, not just 10 candles, but a lot of indie games step in to sure. give you a really specific experience um, that is going to be more powerful in a lot of ways because everything in the system is focused on that one experience it's looking for you to have. When you were originally putting Ten Candles together, what were some of the influences, especially like kind of those indie games that you were talking about? What were some of those that you were looking at to try and build that kind of uh, atmosphere? Yeah, absolutely. So as any you know, tabletop RPG designer in the indie sphere will tell you, about a million different games go into any given creation, right? There's so much borrowing and sort of that that co-inspiration that uh, game creators give each other um, mm. that come together and form a sort of, uh, you know, the, the network by which you create games. So 10 Candles is made up, you know, bits and pieces of it are pulled from a whole ton of different games. Obviously, there was some inspiration from Dread, but sort of the horror aspects of it. But right. I, I knew from the beginning that I didn't want to make another Dread. I didn't want to make a survival horror game. Sure. So in, in a lot of ways, Dread 
inspired me to put put me in a direction of what I didn't want to do. Uh, I mm. wanted to make something that was comparable, but also very different because I knew Dread was already out there. We didn't need another survival horror game. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's sure. some that are out there that are amazing, but I knew Dread. I was familiar with Dread, and I didn't want that. I wanted something new. Um, mm-hmm. Another game that lent itself a bit to my inspiration was um, Polaris uh, by Ben Lehman. Um, not the newer Polaris, the old one that's about about uh, sad ice nights uh, in the North <laughs> Pole. I don't know if you're familiar with it at all. but No, no. Uh, so Polaris is a game where you play as a... Uh, a num a quartet of knights at the North Pole in a world that has never known light. It has always been dark. Um, and very and recently, um, you have started for the first time to see the sun. And with the emergence of the sun over the horizon, um, there have have also been an influx of uh, entities known as the mistaken, which are sort of like demons. And you are playing these knights that are trying to keep the people the people of this this land safe um from themselves from the mistaken from all these other things and you play as these knights who are inevitably going to fall into corruption over the course of many sessions like that the game always ends in tragedy Mm. um eventually these knights will fall um and it's also a game that is resolved with basically no dice it is uh almost all conflicts are resolved through the exchange of ritual phrases and the whole game sort of starts and ends with ritual phrases. Um, and there's a lot of that that's built into the game. So from Polaris, I sort of, I I already kind of had had the idea to do a tragic horror, but a little bit, I was reinforced by that sort of idea where no matter what you do, you slip into kind of losing the game so to speak right but but really what i pulled from polaris uh mostly was the ritual phrases was the idea that there would be ritual phrases and that the game would sort of take the shape of a ritual guided by those phrases so that is directly inspired by polaris i see see. uh and then i think the third the third main one was a game called inspectors um which is a game about um it's sort of a mashup of uh, Ghostbusters and the real world. <laughs> so it's a okay. sort of a reality show, Ghostbuster um, kind of show. Oh, wow. Uh, or kind of a, a role playing game. Yeah. And uh, that game introduced to me the first time about sharing, about sort of competing over narrative stakes. So the idea being that the higher you roll, the more, the more successful you are and the more you get to narrate what, what happens. Ah. So that was really inspired mm-hmm. by uh, Inspectors. So those three games, uh, Inspectors, Polaris, and Dread, helped me round out some corners of that idea in my head and how I wanted certain things to work. Um, sure. And then beyond that, it was just sort of inspired by, you know, when, when I actually, so I, as an example, when I first ran a session of Polaris, mm. I sort of, of my own, out of my own head, decided that I wanted to run it by candlelight and i would have a single sort of long oh. step candle that would be uh, that i'd light with the first ritual phrase and darken with the last ritual phrase and that oh, sort of led oh, to the oh. idea of oh what if mm-hmm. a game only lasted the life of a candle right so from there it all sort of spiraled into this idea uh of sure candles. I, I like that. I also uh, like that there seems to be a uh, a correlation. Something I don't think we've talked about previously uh, on uh, you know about horror games is that that idea of loss that that does seem to be like a common thread. You were mentioning it in Polaris and in Dread, there definitely is a feeling of loss in Ten Candles as well because the lights are going out, the tower is becoming more shaky. Uh, you know that that things things seem to be going away. And uh, and that that is just inherently terrifying, you know, deep down to my core, at least. It's interesting that that's like something that you can really uh, explore into a game, like you can put it into a game. And uh, and, and I have a palpable sensation of it by playing it. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of um, I don't want to call them tricks, but I think uh, there's a lot of ways you can bridge the gap between 
player emotion and character emotion right because if you want to make a game scary for the players you need to make it scary for the characters and if you want to make it scary for the characters you need to make it scary for the players and those sorts of emotions bleed bleed is the technical term uh back and forth between player and character and player and character so if you want your characters to feel lost you need to take something away from the players so as sure. the players lose light and lose their character traits or remove things from the tower, or if you take away their dice or whatever it might be, um, that is a physical loss that the player is experiencing. And then that sure. is going to bleed over into the character as well and vice versa, back and forth. Right, right. I would almost say that uh, compared to almost any other kind of, you know, genre, like a a drama or a comedy or anything, horror itself really has to have that direct connection or it just doesn't work. It it does. Horror. Yeah. Horror uh, is really the genre that relies on bleed. And a lot of games, Mm. you know, you kind of warn people against like, hey, this might get a little intense, you know, be aware, but in horror, you almost need it. Um, yeah. It, 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 the, the genre requires a certain amount of, you know, we need to get you scared so that your characters will be like, will be responding appropriately to the horrible situation that you're in. So a mm-hmm. lot of what 10 candles builds around you with the candles and the atmosphere and how the rules work uh, is all to sort of, again funnel towards that level of immersion and bleed and you know having your characters and your players both share sort of parallel adjacent emotions right right yeah because i'm imagining that when people say i'm gonna go watch a scary movie they don't expect to just be sitting there popping popcorn in their mouth and just saying oh that looks dangerous up on the screen <laughs> like that that they expect to be somewhat you know really immersed in it enough that they actually have that sensation or why would you be going to see a scary movie why would you be playing a scary game you know you you want to have that kind of actual relationship to it right Um, and horror horror movies do this great thing where a lot of the time we will be scared even though the character in the movie isn't scared you know we will see something appear behind them that mm -hmm. they haven't noticed yet and what that does you know we need to be in a lot more fear than the characters do in a movie in order for us to be able to empathize with what they're going through in order for us to be able to react appropriately and care about them. We need to see how dangerous a situation they're in and feel for them and be empathetic. And once we're terrified, then when they start to be terrified or see what's going on around them, we're right there together in that emotional state. And that's what makes those movies so effective. Like they did it in in a few that were more based on Japanese horror, but the idea of like the grudge or something where, the, you know, the ghosts and everything are very, very obvious to us, even though the characters don't necessarily see it. A uh, little bit different than like the jump scare kind of thing where you're yeah. just like, tr- like through their perspective and like, ah, there's a ghost there. Uh, it's the reason why people... People are still terrified of like amnesia because it's like out of the corner of your eye. It's like, oh, there, that doesn't look right. And then all of a exactly. sudden, yeah, yeah, yeah. In general, if I were trying to create this kind of fear, if I was trying to create this kind of a scenario uh, and I'm not good at it because trust me, I am not. Um, what what should my starting point be? Well, if you are. Uh, if you're running 10 candles, my answer would be, sure. you know, grab a module out of the back of the book that's already written there. It's actually really easy for GMs and 10 candles because for the first real like half of the game, you can kind of sit back and not do much. You can just allow the players to have conversations, to explore the scenery. It can be, all be very slow. Um, mm-hmm. There's no need to rush horror. Um, yeah. You can really sit back, you know, in 10 candles or any game. And see what the characters, what the players are gravitating towards, what they find engaging. And all you kind of need to do as a horror GM is to kind of pluck at those strings, follow those threads, and Mm. push them forward to the edge of them. Um, And that will be really successful for you. You know, stick with something that you're comfortable with. And don't worry too much. Let the game do what the game's going to do. And it's going to do a lot of your work for you. And then just sort of sit back and be prepared to step in when 
you need to and then as the game kind of reaches its conclusion where you need to play a larger role at that point just sort of trust that you're going to have everything you need at that point to sort of lead the game towards its end um because it's it's more it it is you know you have sort of a couple uh, an hour or two at that point of the players following threads heading in a direction identifying the monster for you you know at that point you can just sort of take it and run with it okay so i don't necessarily have to be like on all the time it's probably better if i actually just sit back a little bit maybe just be quiet there's a whole there's a whole section in the back uh, of 10 candles the last third of the book is all about you know gm advice and one of the sections is you know when to wait and when to act are two different sections and Uh, you know the whole so there's the whole when to wait section is really all about you know don't be rushed if players are talking let them talk the candles are still going to burn down you know uh and so you're mm-hmm. act, acting almost more like a rules referee and just like a normal gm in any kind of game uh, uh you know explaining the world maybe sprinkling in something a little spooky now and again but your right. players are going to take that and they're going to run with it for the first good half of the game um yeah. until until later when you start winning die rolls and you're going to have to provide some more narration but at that point, you're really so deep into it that you're going to kind of have an idea about how it ends to begin with, you know, at that point. Right. So you're, right. you're going to be in a good spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the great thing about Ten Candles, and I imagine the reason why everybody and their, their aunt ended up playing it the year after we talked, was that, that the tension is automatically built into the mechanic of having those candles. Yes. I can sit back because you're right. Because candles are going to burn down regardless of what I do. And so the tension, the tension's on the table and all, all the players can see it regardless of what I do. <laughs> so Right. Exactly. Yeah. I think there's something to be said for a game where you already know how it's going to end. So right. because you know that, it allows you to play in that space to such a deeper degree. There's so much more there to sink your teeth into because you right. don't have to worry about, you know, trying to win or what might happen at the end. And I think that that yeah. speaks to a lot of people who want a game where, you know, they 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 know it's going to uh, knock it out of the park at the end. And it's just about getting there and they don't have to worry about it as much. They can just sit back and have fun with it. Well, thank you for that advice. Uh, I will uh, probably never end up taking it because I probably won't run games. But if I never run a game, <laughs> and it's it's a scary game, I will I will make sure to use that advice. Perfect. Ooh, I hope you are not too startled by this special spooky episode of the show. Uh, we are very happy that uh, Stephen Dewey was still able to make time for us now that he has had, you know, the super mega hit that is Ten Candles. Uh, I actually did talk to Stephen longer uh, because he has other games that he has done since then that I wanted to get into, some more recent titles from him, and uh, I was able to discuss those with him, but we're going to do that as another episode for another time because... This was supposed to be spooky, and actually his other games are not particularly spooky. They're, they're not really built that way. You'll understand when you hear it. In the meantime, if you would like to get more information about Ten Candles, you can head over to CavalryGames.com, and you can follow Stephen on Twitter at ShiftyGinger. If you want to find anything else about Delve, the best place to go is, well, delvecast.com. You can find all of our videos and articles and podcasts over there. And, of course, this week specifically, we are going to see a few really big things. I actually have a special attempting to play and a new orbital. I know. Can you believe I actually still do that? I, I do. And I made a new episode for Halloween. Uh, So a lot of stuff going up there this week. Uh, And of course, at the end of the week, we're going to have another live episode. So you can uh, you can enjoy that. And I'll tell you, I'll probably be talking about one of the scariest things of all. Questionable video game company practices. While you are on our website, please feel free to click on the Patreon banner and consider becoming a patron to our show for just a whole dollar a month. 
Uh, you can actually get full unedited episodes of the show, and when I can, I try to put them up several days ahead of uh, the actual release of the show. Not all the time, but I do try to release them early for people. Uh, this entire interview, actually, the entire unedited interview, is already up there, uh, including the, the rest that you're going to hear on the next episode. And a big thank you to our Shiny Level patrons, Dominic Perry and Bonnie Ainsworth. You can find our podcast on basically every podcast app known to mankind, including iTunes, or I guess it's Apple Podcasts now. I just keep saying iTunes because it's habit. Uh, also, Google Play and iHeartRadio, Spotify, you name it, we're probably on there. Just look for it. If you can give me stars on any of those platforms, I always appreciate it. Uh, leave a message. Tell us what you liked. Uh, subscribe. Do all of those things. All the things. Do all the things. We always appreciate those. And do not forget to follow us on Twitter. I am at Citanium. Alex is at ESP. ESP. Yep. <laughs> Extrasensory Perception Limited. No, it's EXP Limited. And the show is at Delve Podcast. Thank you again to Stephen Dewey for making time in his very busy schedule of creating hit games to talk to me on the show. And uh, currently I'm working on uh, getting some really great guests on uh, as we round out the year. And I guess I have to start thinking about what we might want to do for special episodes as we get into the, the holiday season as well. Oh boy, so much to work on. Uh, and again, uh, really hoping that Alex feels better. Uh, you know, if you pick up the cursed monkey paw, expect that there's gonna be some complications. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Just some good advice. Let Alex be the cautionary tale for you. Thank you all for joining us on this episode. And I hope we see you on the next one. Uh, unless you're a ghost. Because then I can't see you at all. Ooh, sp spooky. Oh, okay, I think I think I'm all Halloweened out now. Bye, everybody. So I I guess what I want to do though is we've talked about ten candles for a really long time, but I do want to talk about some of the new stuff that you're doing, yeah. uh, and and pivot a little bit to that. I think we've thoroughly scared all of the people listening at this point so <laughs> so so we can move away from that onto another subject